it's summer. John Peterson is training in his kayak, just as his forefathers, the Greenlandic hunters, did. But the world has changed. John isn't a hunter. He's a construction worker and a sportsman. He's training for the Greenland Championships in traditional kayak rowing. John is set on recapturing the title and the honor of being all-round champion, a kayak virtuoso. He lives in Nuuk, Greenland's capital, but prefers to train alone, deep within the fjord. For hunters, training was a question of life and death, of being able to survive by hunting seals and whales in the ice-cold waters. <laughs> The great thing about kayak rowing is going into the quiet. It's as if nature opens up to you in all that stillness. The animals get curious. If you splash the water a little, the seals come up. There are times when I almost bump into them as they suddenly rise to the surface. The Greenlandic kayak, in Eskimo kayak, was originally conceived as a hunting craft. Hunters had to be able to glide silently up to their prey. That's why the oar is slender with sharp edges that cut cleanly through the water. In the old days, oars in treeless Greenland were fashioned from driftwood. Apart from driftwood, the only other useful materials that barren land could offer were stone, bone and skin, mainly seal skin. A skin casing made from a whole seal was used as a float, otherwise known as a bladder bag. This tired the harpoon prey and prevented it from diving to the bottom. A long line leads from the bladder bag to a loose harpoon head, a contrivance elegant in its simplicity. And the throwing stick, a narrow piece of wood, lengthens the arm of the skilled hunter so that he can hit an object at 20 meters distance with deadly precision. Originally, the Greenlanders were a seal hunting people, a lifestyle that continues in some remote spots right up to the present day. Hunting is still the only possible means of subsistence in North and East Greenland. There was a clear division of roles in the old hunting societies. Men hunted, women scraped the skins and looked after home and children. In good times, sealing provided the Greenlanders with all that they needed. Food, blubber for light and warmth, and skins sewn by the women into clothes and covers for the kayaks, which in times of need could serve as provisions. They ate the covers. Everywhere in Greenland, the kayak was adapted to the local hunting conditions and nature. Already in the 1600s, it had achieved its most elegant form. The kayak man becomes one with his craft. He becomes an amphibian. He navigates to the ocean's tides, the wave's rhythm, the wind's song and the smells of land and sea. The Arctic Ocean is a capricious workplace. Other dangers lie in wait for the kayak men. Hunters seldom live to be old. Many come to a watery grave. Around 1920, kayak accidents accounted for 10% of all deaths in Greenland. 
On long journeys, life is literally dependent on mittens and skins. A duvalik is a special anorak sewn from sealskin. It's fastened watertight around the kayak's cockpit and the wrists and face, where it's tightened until one becomes really ugly. A kayak mitten has two thumbs. When you've rowed all day long, the palms get very wet and slippery. So you just turn them around and use the dry side. Even though hunters prefer working with one or two others, the individual must be able to look after himself. For example, be able to ride a capsized kayak using his oar as a lever. But what if you lose the oar? Well, the best rowers can right themselves either by using the harpoon's throwing stick or with their arms alone. There are 30 ways to roll over. John Peterson knows that all of these will be included in the coming Greenlandic Championships. But during the course of a long day at sea, Problems other than irascible polar bears and walruses can arise. Needs must when the devil drives. Bladder bags have many uses. No one knows for certain where the kayak comes from. Its origins are lost in the mists of Bering Strait. Presumably, its forerunner was a covered canoe. Much later, the vessel was adopted by the Thule culture, a dynamic Eskimo culture of hunters that emerged from Alaska about 1000 AD and quickly spread eastward. The clans infiltrated the shores of the Arctic reaching Greenland some 200 years later, taking the same routes as other long-dead hunting cultures before them. With dog sleds, kayaks and large family boats, umiaks, the wanderers crossed the ice-filled sound to North Greenland and took possession of the world's largest island. They were the forefathers of today's Greenlanders. Greenland coast, traces of the tool culture to be found. On his way home from four days training, John prefers to stretch his legs wherever there's something of interest to see. Memories of his ancestors' unique capacity for adaption. To think this ruin once formed the framework for the life of a large family. But in 1920, this ancient settlement Kharusuk was abandoned. A warm climatic change sent the seals further north and filled the fjords with cod. The kayak men were now obliged to switch from hunting to fishing and they moved closer together in villages. But with time, many of the villages were also abandoned. In 1974, the inhabitants of Kangach gave up their free lifestyle in favor of welfare and time clocks at the fish factory. They moved to the capital, Nuuk.
13,000 of Greenland's entire population of only 53,000 are concentrated in the capital. Nuuk is a fishing industry town and the supply centre for all Greenland. The heart of every Greenlandic town is its harbour, where the Atlantic ships dock and the marinas swarm with dinghies, the successors to the kayak. On the factory's wharf, trawlers unload their catch. Today, shrimps are absolutely the most important export product. But already in the early 50s, under the country's hectic modernization, the kayak as a work craft ended up in the newly established museum. Far-sighted persons just managed to save some examples for posterity. For certain, children and young people prefer rap and skateboards. Once John too was a champion skateboarder, even gaining a place in the Guinness Book of Records with a jump of six meters. But what was it that persuaded John to emulate his grandfather? Well, I have complete faith in the kayak. One might say that without kayaks, we could not have survived in Greenland. I am deeply grateful to our ancestors for having used the kayak as a hunting tool. More and more young people are beginning to recognize the kayak as the Greenlanders' contribution to world culture. Today, every town boasts a flourishing kayak club whose members prefer to construct their own kayaks. John has built five, all tailor-made to the user without, as tradition dictates, the use of nail or screw. An old kayak man impressed upon us that the most important attribute of a kayak rower is to be strong, not only physically, but deep within your soul. And that we must never give up when we're at sea. Courage is your only safeguard from the moment you sail until the moment you return. Finally, July 23rd saw the start of the Greenland Kayak Championships. 123 participants and many visitors streamed to Sisimut from near and far. Sisimut, 400 kilometers north of Nuuk, is Greenland's third largest town, situated right on the Arctic Circle at the foot of Nasasak. The old buildings go back to the 1700s, a colorful era in Greenland's history, when Danish colonization supplanted European whale hunting and bartering. When the snow is gone, the huskies take a vacation. Even in the middle of summer, they have to endure a pelt created to withstand minus 40 degrees centigrade. Greenland's only swimming pool is usually packed with children, but not when the kayak championships are in town. During the next
next 10 days, John and the other participants will compete in eight different disciplines, all deeply anchored in the ancient art of the hunter. Each town contributes three men for the relay, where the exchange takes place right across from the judge's table and the spectators. Until now, naturally enough, the sport of kayaking has always been dominated by men. But here too, the equal rights movement has influenced Greenlandic society. The championships combine top sport with family rallies. And the next generation is on its way. Hello. Many of the visitors have turned up to see the mother of kayak models all over the world, the Greenlandic kayak. In the individual disciplines, John can look forward to strong competition, not least from Fritz Johansson, a full-time hunter and fisher up from Disco Bay. 36 contestants have signed up for the men's events. The kayak talent, Alan Josefsson, the carpenter's apprentice from Kokotok, must also be counted amongst the favorites. Besides the relay, the men compete in short and long distance races as well as in a grueling combination of rowing and cross country running, nine kilometers in all. The kayak men are used to taking shortcuts over an isthmus or running up to the lakes during reindeer hunts, bearing their 20 kilo craft on their shoulders. Fritz Johansson is flying high. He wins not only the combination race, but all the other races as well. And so is in the lead for the honorable title of Kayak Virtuoso. Despite a cold, John Peterson is reasonably satisfied with his performance, but other disciplines await. Much can still change. <coughs> One is, after all, a professional hunter. Fritz meets up for the harpoon throwing trials with all his hunting gear. Besides the distance throwing, the men also compete in precision casting. The inner circle is barely the size of a seal's head. Yes, well in the old days, that kayak rower's family would have starved through the winter. The opponents are well matched, but in the end, Fritz must cede victory in the harpoon throwing to his rival, John.
Rope gymnastics are an ancient form of Greenlandic sport, excellent as preliminary training for the difficult kayak rolling. The discipline includes 74 exercises. The task is to complete as many as possible in half an hour. Apart from flexibility, rope gymnastics require toughness, just the discipline for the highly talented Alan Josephson. On the other hand, rope gymnastics are absolutely not the thing for heavy athletes. So John does significantly better here and narrows the distance between his and Fritz's total scores. The end of the rally draws near. The last item on the program is rolling, the climax of the championships. It's here that the final placings will be decided. The exercise requires 30 different tasks, all the possible variations on a kayak capsizing at sea. This is John's last chance at winning the title of kayak virtuoso. Most competitors manage the simple rolls with ease, but even strongman Fritz has to give up on the more difficult ones. Later in the evening, only the true artists are left on the water, and there are just two, Alan and John. It's going to be a regular duel. They both complete the rolls with throwing sticks, first one way round, then the other, with bravura. Not even the difficult roles, using only their arms as aids, phase them. And they both do well in the more specialized trials, such as rolling over with a bladder bag or holding an eight kilo stone. they can hold their own against the pull of six grown men, which corresponds to a harpoon walrus dragging a hunter. <laughs> Finally, the most difficult of all, rolling by using only the upper part of the body. Alan goes first. The current is strong. Oh no. Arm
arms have to be crossed for the whole roll. Now it's John's turn. This mistake would have been fatal. John Peterson wins the rolling by the smallest possible margin. But enough to be crowned once again at the celebration party in the sports hall as Greenland's best kayak rower. Truly a kayak virtuoso.